From the City of London, for our viewers worldwide, Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, division in D.C. casting a cloud over fiscal talks. New restrictions darkening the outlook in Europe. And with credit spreads widening, Treasuries doing nothing. And we begin with a big issue. Treasuries hitting snooze. It's been awfully calm in the bond market for a long time now. Ten-year Treasury yields are absolutely unchanged. Investors are looking for a new safe haven. You can choose to invest in ten-year Treasuries. Nobody really wants to buy... 30-year treasuries at 150 or 10-year treasuries at 70 basis points. Or you can go buy high-yield bonds or investment grade or equity, or you can buy other assets. Treasuries at 67 basis points doesn't do it anymore. It has been range-bound. Central banks are determined at the moment. Dangling the carrot to... Uh, uh to keep fixed income investors interested at these low yields. They're keeping yields low, they're crushing yields. It makes sense to take a little more credit risk. Joining us now is BlackRock's Jeff Rosenberg. Jeff, fantastic to get you on the show today on this topic. I think Thanks, it's really Sean. important. The role Treasuries play in a portfolio from 2020 looking out, and I know it's a huge topic over at BlackRock. Jeff, how are you guys thinking about this question at the moment? Yeah, yeah, I wrote a, a piece on this, and we continue to write under the theme of investing without a parachute. And, you know, September, Jonathan, is a really good uh, example. You know, when we when we wrote our pieces on it and everybody's talking about it, it, it was kind of like, okay, what what does the new world look like that we're going into with the proximity to the zero lower bound? Well, we found out in September, you know, equities down 8% and Treasury yields is the lead uh, kind of uh, highlighted by all those comments, you know, barely, barely budging at all. And so it's the combination of, you know, the low yield makes the income you know, relatively unattractive and a couple of comments in there about, you know, just go and, and take credit risk. Maybe we'll come around to that, that question in a second. But the other thing that's really difficult about the investing outlook right now with where Treasury yields are is that they're not moving much lower. And that's because they're, they're pretty low to begin with. And the proximity to the zero lower bound means they don't have much further to fall. And so you've lost the hedging efficacy. Uh, and that's as big of, a, of an issue uh, to to investors, not just fixed income investors, but all investors who've been using fixed income as as critical ballast in their portfolio, that's as important of an issue as the as the loss of income. So, Jeff, let's discuss that, and then we can get to how you make it up elsewhere with the credit risk, perhaps. But on the question of investing without a parachute, is there a replacement in your mind for Treasuries? Something to put in the mix in the 40 side of the portfolio, or is the 60 40 mix something we need to put in the trash and totally start again with and rethink? Well, I, I think we have to start by just appreciating how remarkable the 40 was that for 20, even 40 years, we, we faced a, a very unique confluence of events that made the hedging efficacy so wonderfully attractive. And, and it's a recognition that those things aren't a given. They're not structural. They're not a right that you're going to have effectively your hedge and get it for free. They were really a consequence of the unique structure of, of the past environment. And recognizing that, you realize that the structure going forward, those underlying determinants of what made fixed income so effective are all facing very significant challenges in the in the current environment. So the, the the bottom line answer is no, there isn't a simple replacement because what was lost was was very significant and it was very unique in, in terms of the 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 set of uh, the confluence of events that led to its behavior. And it's not simply we can substitute nominal bonds with tips or gold yeah. uh, or, or FX currency. You know, all of those are, are kind of partial solutions. Uh, we're really going to have to think much more holistically uh, about portfolio construction in, in, in the future and today's investing environment. Well, Jeff, let's start with a series of assumptions, the kind of assumptions you think people should start to make. You could assume that you should take less risk and assume lower returns, or you might make the assumption that you need to embrace higher volatility, take more risk and do it that way. Jeff, what are the assumptions that you think investors should make in order to make the next decision, which is what to buy and which bucket to place the cash in? 
Well, you know, I, I I don't think it's so much about the the assumptions as much as it is about forecast. Now, maybe you know my forecast is someone else's assumption, but it's it's really about what is the current and future structure of financial markets, both in terms of expected returns and correlations, hedging efficacy, and what does that imply about building portfolios to achieve objectives? Now, if your objective is, say, a 7% long-term pension return, and you're looking at that relative to today's levels of expected returns, one might simply say, okay, my solution to that is to take on more risk in order to achieve those returns. And that might be prioritizing one objective, the attainment of that expected return, over another objective, which is the stability of my assets, the stability of my uh, asset liability mismatch over time. So I think what investors have to recognize and look at here is that the attainment of their objectives is going to is going to entail a much greater degree of trade-offs than we had before when we're thinking about the portfolio mix with fixed income. Jeff, just in terms of the conversations you're having at the moment, different clients, different investors, different mandates, different objectives. Of the pool of investors at the moment that you speak to, who do you think is ahead on this that's giving it a lot more thought than maybe some others? And who do you think needs to think about it with a little bit more clarity and detail, with a lot more effort? Well, you know, I think everybody is thinking about it because the reality uh, was really laid quite clear uh, in the September FOMC minutes and, and uh, the meeting, I mean, uh, you know, if there was one kind of takeaway, it was the extension of the forecast period to 2023 and no change in the interest rate outlook. So for those who were kind of hoping that, hey, it was a crisis response, the Fed is going to normalize, we've been at zero interest rates before and we can we can wait it out. I think it was a recognition that this is a different operating environment, right? The, the operative uh, implementation of the new policy framework of flexible average inflation targeting is also now kind of dawning on folks that even after attaining their objectives, they're going to keep interest rates at zero. So it's a very different kind of environment than investors faced the last time post GFC. We were at the zero lower bound and the whole conversation was what does normalization look like? What will lift off feel like? I can wait and I'll get back to kind of normal 3% risk free interest rates. It's very different, and I think that is dawning on investors across the investment spectrum, particularly after we've seen now uh, another year of forecasted interest rates uh, staying at zero. So, Jeff, I'd love to know what that means for you as you think about embracing risk. High yield spreads have actually winded this week. Not a significant amount, but not a insignificant amount. A move of 30, 40 basis points on the week so far on high yield. Do you think that means it's harder for credit spreads to widen? this environment, that it makes it more difficult, not just because of the things you've described for the last five minutes, but also because we have a price insensitive buyer in the credit market in the shape of the Federal Reserve. How does that shape your views on credit? Yeah, it's it, there's a couple of different cross currents here. You know, the, the first one is, you know, the Fed and, and, and the Fed support is obviously most explicitly in investment grade spreads as opposed to high yield spreads. So there's a real dampening of volatility there. You know, implicitly, there's some more support for the crossover area of the market, fallen angels, that provides a bit of support. Um, and so the first order effect is that dampens the volatility and the response from kind of day-to-day -day moves or even, you know, smaller drawdown moves like we've seen in the month of September. Investment grade spreads have, have barely budged. The reaction to high yield is is lower than it otherwise would be. So that gives you a, a degree of support uh, for cushioning some of those some of those blows. I think uh, I think the other aspect is, when thinking about credit is that it's related to the earlier line of questioning around the, the loss of ballast, the loss of hedging efficacy. So if I'm thinking about spread risk in my portfolio. And I'm thinking about, okay, what are my offsets to that? What kind of hedges do I have in my portfolio? Well, I have hedges. I have risk-free interest rates. They have negative correlation, but their beta is collapsed. So the amount of risk that I run in my credit portfolio when I'm trying to find balance in that portfolio with offsets from risk-free rates is just a lot lower, which means I've got to manage that risk and either accept 
that I have higher risk or change the character of the risky assets that I'm investing in on the risky asset part of the portfolio in recognition that my hedge efficacy is much lower in today's environment. Jeff, a fascinating conversation, especially with some of the clouds on the horizon at the moment, looking into year end. I want to get to the rapid fire round with you quickly. Just three quick questions, three quick answers, if I may. One thing that you and I haven't discussed so far is the fiscal package. Jeff, from where you sit, do you think we can get a fiscal agreement in D.C. before the election? Just a quick yes or no, Jeff. No, I think it's unlikely before. Next question on high yield, an important one for many people right now. I've asked this several times over the last several weeks. Still in and around 500 basis points, the spread, high yield. Do you think we see 400 or 600 first? What's first, 400 or 600, Jeff? That's a, that's a tricky one post the election outcome, but I'm going to say 400 first. OK. Final question for you, sir. Ten-year Treasury in and around 70 basis points. I've gone back to this question multiple times over the last several weeks as well. We're slap bang in the middle of that post-April range, 50 basis points to 90 basis points. Do you think we break out of that range to the upside or to the downside, Jeff? Uh, it may sound a little contradictory to my uh, high-yield uh, answer, but, but to, the, to the downside more than, than the upside in the, in the short run. Interesting. Hey, Jeff, great to catch up. Send my best to Thanks, the team. Jonathan. Jeff Rosenberg Likewise. there of BlackRock. Thank you, sir. Time now for the final spread. The week ahead coming up tomorrow and next week. President Donald Trump announcing his Supreme Court nominee on Saturday. Then it's the first presidential debate on Tuesday. Fed speak coming from Mester, Harker, Williams and ECB President Christine Lagarde speaking ahead of the EU summit on Thursday. We get US GDP, jobless claims and finally, this one's come around quick. Payrolls Friday next week. That is it for me. We'll see you next Friday at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. Have a wonderful weekend. This was Bloomberg Real Yield. This is Bloomberg.